Greetings. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Eve. I'm an illustrator with a very strong love for watercolor and cats. First of all, I want to thank you guys for the very nice reception of the first episode. I want to say that I'm sorry for the delay. I know you guys understand in the circumstances and I just wanted to thank you for your patience. It means a lot to me. This episode, I want to talk about comparison. We all know what comparison is. It's basically when you evaluate two or more things and for each of them you check which characteristics they have in common, which characteristics are different, to which extent for each of them. And then you can sort of have the profile of the thing and really compare one to the other. In art, much like in life, comparison is everywhere. I think it's particularly tricky with art, though. Comparison in this case is very, very stifling for creativity. And I agree, that's true. In general, art is referred to as a personal endeavor. And in that sense, it's making comparisons pointless. Because the value of art is not through being compared with other art. It's on its own, you know, if you if you know what I mean. On the other hand, though... <laughs> A lot of commercial art jobs are about comparing what one does to what others do in the same area of expertise. There are trends, there are things that are really in demand versus things that are not in demand. And if you want to be a commercial illustrator, you sort of have to be aware of what is sought by companies at every moment, you know. I know there's a bit of room for personal styles, but still, from what I can extrapolate from my studies in graphic design and what I know of illustration, it happens often that you will receive an offer for a job and they might tell you that they want a specific illustration in a specific style, regardless of what your portfolio is. So yeah, basically... You're being told to emulate the style. A company might come to you and say, I really want an illustration in the style of either someone like Andy Warhol or, you know, the, the big names of <laughs> the big artists out there. But it also can be about, like I said, trends in the illustration world. Like if something is really, really big, at the moment, you might be told that they want that from you, even if there's nothing really like that in your portfolio. In a sense, what they're after is just your skills. They want what you're capable of doing with your hands, with your brain, but the focus is a lot less on whatever creative input you can add to the, the offer, to the work. We used to call that um, being a Photoshop monkey. <laughs> In the sense that sometimes what was needed for a specific job was not, per se, an, an artist or an illustrator or whatnot, but more like someone who can use a specific software and produce stuff with the software and conform to whatever style directive you receive. Another element to comparison, I feel, with art is that a lot of learning is done through following classes and tutorials, where it's really about the teacher, the artist teaching. They go through their own process in details. It feels a bit like a step-by-step -step that you have to follow as a student, and a lot of students will try to copy that to learn. But in the same way, it's really difficult to avoid comparison in this case, because you're basically copying something or following the recipe for something. So like it or not, in the end, your end result, I think it's expected to compare the end result to the teacher's demonstration result so that you can evaluate what you got right and what you did not get right. Yeah, I fully realize that getting stuff right when it comes to art is a very vague concept. And ultimately, it really depends on what you want as an artist. But I still feel like these kind of tutorials or step-by-step, -step, they make it really easy to compare. So to sum it up, 
uh, comparison in art. Either people tell you not to do it, that it's a really bad idea, that it's it's not going to help you, it's only going to make you miserable, and you're you're not going to enjoy what you're doing. But you also have this aspect to it that it's really, really difficult to not end up in a situation where you you find yourself comparing because everything is built, or well, not if not everything, a lot of things are built to that end goal. Like the way certain jobs are set up. I really, really hope that it has gotten better and that there are less um, demands to copy specific styles and that the illustrators that are making a living out of it have a bit more room to be themselves. But still, it's kind of tricky. For me, I kind of always felt like not comparing was a luxury. That it's something that I just can't avoid. Especially now with internet. Internet has really made that a lot more present than it used to be. Before internet! <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's either stuff like you are told to build your portfolio by really researching and looking at what other people are doing, especially people who have the kind of job you would like to have. And to see what they're doing, see what kind of work is successful, and then keep that in mind when you work on your art pieces. So basically, it's like, you gotta compare what you're doing to what is working, and then try to make what you're doing something that works too. <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a basically a comparison. And then with internet, like I said, it's, it's almost impossible to avoid <laughs> other people's art. And you see their art, you see what you like, you see how popular it is really easily, thanks to likes and retweets and whatnot. And there's a correlation between being very popular on social media and being able to make a living with art. So for anyone who is struggling or anyone who would like to make a living out of what they do, what they draw, what they paint, that's kind of not something you can avoid. And if you are easily impressed, uh, it's even harder. <laughs> These are really tough waters to navigate, in my opinion. How is one not supposed to compare? Unless you live in a vacuum that doesn't have internet, that doesn't have um, art anywhere. But like it or not, art is everywhere. Might not be as obvious here as it is in other countries. I'm speaking for Canada, but and packaging, and ads, and posters, in everything, there's a bit of art, you know, that you always end up seeing. And then there's the internet, and even if you cut that off, well, there's books, there's libraries, there's expositions, there are museums. There's a bunch of stuff, like, it's there. <laughs> if you want to see art, it's really easy. What's difficult is if you don't want to see any, like... You want no inspiration, no influence at all. That's, that's the toughest one to manage. I wish I had a clever solution or a really good suggestion here or to have something to tell you to help uh, when it comes to comparison, but I don't. Comparison is something that I struggle a lot with. I'm really, really slowly finding ways to deal with it, but it's, it's a, an everyday battle. Also, with the fact that I'm getting super old, um, it doesn't help <laughs> the comparison because now you see youngins, you see people who are like 16, 17, 18, 19, and you see the work they do, and you're like, oh my gosh, you're so good, and then you sort of take a step back and you're like, wait, wait, how old am I? Oh my gosh, I'm, <laughs> I'm so helpless. But see, that's, that's the way it becomes problematic. And I know it's a problem. I know it's something that... I have to sort of figure out. Sometimes I go through periods of avoiding certain social media platforms just to try and refocus on what I like to do or what I do, like what me, <laughs> what I do. <laughs> Other times when I'm really sort of, I can't get out of it, I'm, I'm really focused on the influence of a specific artist, someone that I really like their work, and I sort of can't get it out of my head. I've come up with a sort of small art inspiration questionnaire that I like to ask myself to help me figure things out. 
It's super, super simple. It's basically two questions or two elements to it. First off, I, I start by writing the artist's name, just so I sort of know what this is about. And so I will write, you know, Picasso. <laughs> Whoever it is, it could be like someone on Twitter that you find really, really good. It doesn't have to be like a, a big name, but it's just easy for the sake of demonstration to use someone like Picasso. So you could look at his work and be like, okay, what are the main characteristics of their art? What sort of resonates the most? So it can be words like, it's stylized, it's dynamic, uh, bright colors, the way the person deals with lighting, the kind of poses they have for their characters, the facial expressions, you know? You just sort of look at it and try to really figure out what appeals to you the most in their work. Like, why you keep coming back to that and why it's stuck in your brain. So I try to write that down. Then I, I have my list, or it doesn't have to be a very big list, but I have my elements that I feel are really things that call to me in the person's work. So the second thing I do is that I ask myself, would you want to do what they do? Like, if this was coming from you, if these were your drawings, your paintings, how would you feel about that? Would you want to do what they do? Which is basically a yes-no question. So I try to answer it with yes or no. Do I want to do what they do? If I say yes, then I go back and I take a second look at the list of the characteristics that I wrote. And I try to find ways to detach the element from what the artist does and bring it into my work. Say I like this, this stylization. Well, that's something that I can just say, okay, so I need, when I draw, to keep in mind to stylize more, to go back to the basic shapes, to do something, you know, if it's dynamic, you know, I gotta keep in mind to use more diagonals and use elements to make things more dynamic, or the lighting, like, whatever it is that you thought was really good in the person's work, you try to see what it would mean for you to incorporate it in your work, like, what kind of work that would be to have that in your work. Work, work, work. <laughs> um, I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain. If the answer to the question is no, I wouldn't want to do exactly what they do, then it relieves a lot of pressure because the thing that I love, like their work, the artist's drawings and paintings, they become something that I enjoy to look at. It removes all the pressure of being obsessed with it because it's like, okay, so when I look at this, it's only for fun, you know. It's not in the sense of there's something in there that I want to add into what I do. So in a sense, the, the two questions help me regain a bit of perspective. It often brings me back to the ground again. To sum it up really quickly, I ask myself two questions. First is, what are the main characteristics of their art, in my opinion? And then, would I want to do what they do, yes or no? I've done it many times for many different artists, and it always helps me take a step back and move into a more proactive mindset than just the comparison mindset. Another thing that I try to do is to find inspiration in things that are a bit more general and less of the, you know, the teacher's own way of doing things. To me, a teacher's own way of doing things is when you see someone like Jean Haynes giving classes and all of that, she has a really unique and specific style. So to me, that's really personal. The other side of that, sort of the, not the opposite, but the other idea that the kind of things that I seek out more would be things that are more about a general way to work with inspiration. I feel like that is more useful because I can take a really basic element that I can dress up with my own style. I know I mentioned it in a recent live stream, but my latest find in terms of books that I find generally inspiring is Anna Victoria Calderon's book titled Color Harmony for Artists, How to Transform Inspiration into Beautiful Watercolor Palettes and Paintings. Long title, I know. <laughs> I'll put the link to the book in the description of this episode, and uh, you can go check it out if you want. I feel like that book is a really good demonstration of a way that you can take someone's knowledge and really benefit from it. As a quick word of the end for this episode, I just want to reiterate that for me, I feel like comparing myself to other artists will always be a thing. I don't see how I would ever get rid of that, even if it's not, you know, the best of habits. 
But at the same time, I feel like I'm also making progress in how I deal with it. And instead of being something really negative, I feel like I'm slowly forming ways to make something constructive out of this feeling that is very often destructive for me. I don't know if it will help, I don't know if it's useful at all, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about this because I feel like it's something each and every one of us struggles with. In that sense, is comparison something that affects you and your art? How do you deal with it? That's it for this second episode on the theme of comparisons. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below, and thank you very much for listening. Take care, stay sane, and bye-bye.